In this video, we're gonna cover three things you have to know to pass the Praxis Core Math Test. My name's Scott Roselle, and I'm the founder of 240 Tutoring. I know you have to know these things because I've helped over 20,000 teachers pass their certification exam. And you don't have to take my word for it, you can check out our Facebook reviews. And these three concepts I'm gonna go over are key to conquering the core, so keep watching. As a former teacher, I know what it's like waking up at 2 a.m. hoping you can frantically cram for the most important test of your career. I know the fear of failing, having to tell your family and friends that you're not gonna be a teacher because you couldn't pass a test. I hate that feeling. I mean, I really hate that feeling. That's why it's my goal to give you the tools you need to pass the Praxis exam. And knowing the test structure and the exact concepts you have to master to pass the test is key. So I'm gonna outline the most important concepts you have to know. Now the first thing to know are basic mathematical formulas, and you have to know all of them. <laughs> Just kidding. Praxis focuses on five basic math formulas. Now, a formula in math just gives you a way to set up the information to find the right answer. They aren't very complicated. And the formulas you need to know for Praxis are perimeter, area, volume, slope-intercept form, and the Pythagorean theorem. Perimeter simply allows you to find the length of an outline of a shape. To find the perimeter, simply add all the shape's sides together. Area is the measurement of a surface of a shape. Area is generally found by multiplying the sides of the shape together to get the area. Circles get a little bit more complicated. Volume is simply how much space a shape takes up. And to find the volume, you typically multiply the width times the length times the height. Slope-intercept form is important for solving two variable equations and plotting them on a graph. Slope-intercept form is most commonly written as y equals mx plus b, where m and b are real numbers, like two or five or 37. m tells us what the slope of the line is, and B tells us where the line crosses the Y axis. So if the formula is Y equals 2X plus 5, we can tell for every one space the line moves right on a graph, it moves up two spaces, that's the slope. We can also tell the line crosses the Y axis at 0, 5, and that's the Y intercept. Now, this is easier done than said, so keep watching. I'm gonna give you real life examples with practice questions. The final formula you really need to know is the Pythagorean theorem. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. And when I say old, I mean like 2,500 years old. The Pythagorean theorem states that the square of the side of the triangle opposite the right angle, also called the hypotenuse, is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. In other words, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And as long as you know the length of the two sides of a triangle, you can use this formula to find the length of the hypotenuse or the other side. The second concept we're gonna cover has to do with statistics. Now, don't get too concerned because it's very basic statistics and there's really four concepts you have to know. Mean, median, mode, and range. Now, mean, median, and mode are all dealing with numbers and averages. Who wants to be average? Mean does, that's who. Mean is the mathematical term for what's considered the average. Now, to find the average or the mean, you simply add all the numbers together and then divide by the number of numbers there are. So to find the average of one, two, and three, you add one plus two plus three, which gives you six. Then you divide by three, because we added together three numbers. The average of one, two, and three is two. Now mode is the most popular one. Mode is the number that occurs most often in a sequence. And if there's not a number that appears more than once, then there's no mode. Range is the difference between the smallest number and the largest number in a number sequence. So the range of one, two, three, and four is three, because three is the difference between one and four. You simply subtract the smallest from the greatest to get the range. Now don't worry, we're gonna cover a few real practice questions so you can see how these concepts will appear on the test. And the third concept you have to know on the Praxis Core Math is how to read graphs. On your exam, you will see bar graphs, pictographs, scatter plots, plenty of coordinate graphs, which is plotting out numbers on the X and Y axis. Now graphs are a really big deal, so you have to know how to read them and how to understand what the graph is communicating. We'll go over a few of the graphs that are going to appear on the test and how to read and understand them. Now, you might be wondering, how do I know so much about the test? Am I some sort of mathematical wizard? Nope, not a wizard. Praxis actually provides a detailed understanding about what's on the test in the Praxis Core Study Companion. The Study Companion is written in a way that's very informative, but also very, very boring. And just like the old adage says, ain't nobody got time for that. Thankfully, you've got me, you've got this video, and we all have access to the 242 Tutoring Study Guides. And if you want more practice questions, the 242 Tutoring Study Guides have hundreds of practice questions, instructional content, flashcards. If you think this video is helpful, 
you will love the Praxis Core Study Guide from 240 Tutoring. But enough about me. Let's walk through some real examples so you can see exactly how these concepts are going to appear on the actual test. A cement pipe used in a storm drain system is an eight foot long right circular cylinder with a wall thickness of three inches and an outside diameter of 24 inches. Which of the values best approximates the volume in cubic feet of the interior pipe? The formula for the volume V of a right circular cylinder with a radius of R and a height of H is V equals pi R squared H. The answer options are A, 14.1, B, 113, C, 2034.7, or D, 25.1. Now, if the diameter of a pipe is 24 inches, then the radius of the pipe is 12 inches, because diameter is just half the radius. If the wall of the pipe has a thickness of three inches, then the interior of the pipe has a radius of 12 minus three, which equals nine inches. Because the calculation is to be performed in cubic feet and not inches, nine inches must be converted to feet. This can be done using the conversion factor of one foot equals 12 inches, so you can cancel out the inches and bring in feet. So nine inches times one foot of 12 inches equals nine feet divided by 12, which reduces to three quarter feet or 0.75 feet. Therefore, the radius to use in the volume calculation is 0.75 feet. The length of the cement pipe was given at eight feet. Accordingly, the value to use the height of the right circular cylinder is eight feet. Finally, substitutions can be made in the appropriate calculations performed using 3.14 as an approximation for pi in the formula for volume, which is pi r squared times height. So the volume of the interior of the pipe is discovered to be approximately 14.13 cubic feet. The best answer to select from the options, therefore, is 14.1. Which of the following equations is written in slope-intercept form? y equals 3x plus 5, x equals 3y plus 5, 3y minus 5x equals 10, y plus 5 equals 3x. Now, slope intercept form of the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b, where m and b are numbers representing the slope of the line and its y-intercept respectively. Only the answer choice y equals 3x plus 5 is presented in this format. Jim wants to walk to Bill's house. To get to Bill's house, Jim walks three miles south and then walks four miles east. Jim wants to know how many miles he would have walked if he had instead walked in a straight line. How many miles would Jim have walked if he had walked in a straight line to Bill's house? A, four, B, five, C, six, D, seven. This problem can be solved by visualizing Jim's path or drawing an image. To walk three miles south and then four miles east demands a 90 degree turn and creates a right angle or an L shape. When the straight line is drawn in from Jim's starting point to his end point at Bill's house, the L becomes a right triangle. The unknown length of the straight line is the missing length of the hypotenuse of the right triangle. That value can be found using the Pythagorean theorem. The sum of the squares of the legs of a right triangle equals the square of the length of the hypotenuse, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the legs and c is the hypotenuse. In this case, the known side lengths are legs, so three squared plus four squared equals c squared. This equation simplifies to nine plus 16 equals c squared which itself simplifies to 25 equals c squared. By applying a square root to each side of the equation, the hypotenuse length is seen to be five. Therefore, if Jim had walked to Bill's house in a straight line, he would have walked five miles. Aaron runs on a treadmill for an hour each day. He recorded the number of miles completed on each run for the last 10 days. The length of each run in miles is given above. What is the range of the length of Aaron's run during this period in miles? A, 0.1, B, 0.14, C, 1.6, D, 7.5. To find the range of the length of Aaron's runs, one strategy would be to order the list of the lengths given from least to greatest. The ordered list is 6.9 all the way to 8.3, 6.9 being the least and 8.3 being the most. From this list, it is clear that Aaron's shortest run was 6.9 miles and his longest run was 8.3 miles. The range of a data set is the difference between the highest and lowest values of the set. And so 8.3 minus 6.9 is calculated to get 1.4, the range of the lengths of Aaron's run for this 10 day time period. The scatter plot above shows data that is best described as having a strong negative linear correlation between X and Y, 
a very weak negative linear correlation between y and x, a strong positive linear correlation between x and y, a very weak positive linear correlation between x and y. Though not all the data is perfectly lined up, this data does show a relatively strong linear correlation because of the relatively tight cluster of the data and the rough shape of a line. If a line were to be drawn here, almost all the data would be close to the line. The correlation is negative because the path of the cluster of the points appears to aim downwards as a graph is viewed from left to right. That is, the data points show decreasing y values as x values increase, like a line with a negative slope. If you want even more practice questions, Google the ultimate guide to passing the Praxis Core by 240 Tutoring. On that page, you'll get even more practice questions and a more in-depth, comprehensive breakdown of the test. If you like the video, please like it and then subscribe to 240 Tutoring. We're always pushing out great content and we want to keep you updated.